Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part five, or no, part six in the Macintosh Repairathon series. If you haven't seen the previous parts, I recommend you watch those first, as this is a continuation of where we left off there. In the last part, I finished closing up all those Mac Classic machines, well, two Mac Classics and a Mac Classic 2. But in this part, it's time to look at these two Mac Pluses. Hopefully it's a simple fix for both of these and then get them both working. So let's get right to it. These are the two machines, and as you see, we've looked at them in part one. The first one has a power cycling issue. The second one I wrote boots, but has no display. Because it was probably a little confusing how I kept jumping around between machines in the last few parts, I'm going to focus on one of these at a time, and let's start with number two. So the good thing about these Mac Pluses is these machines were made before the days of surface mount electrolytics. Those are the ones that leaked all over those other machines. So it's very unlikely that there is a capacitor issue on the main board with these machines. And all of the issues are probably going to be with the analog board, which of course is this board right here, the power supply and the CRT driver. But I think as a first step, let me pull out the motherboard and let's take a look at it and just make sure that it looks good. It's definitely a little bit of uh, corrosion on the disk drive here. Maybe some liquid has dripped into here at some point. I don't know. These machines have a little cover that goes over the bottom of the motherboard. Let's slide the board out. And there it is. There's a sticker that came off something that fell down on the board. Some kind of a serial number sticker. There are electrolytics on here. These are axials though. And it's very unlikely that these have leaked, but I can test these with my LCR meter just to make sure they're good. But in all likelihood, these are gonna be fine. Not much going on in the back of the board. There are no components whatsoever. It's all very clean except for some flux residue on the main connector that goes to the analog board. And also it looks like the two serial ports here were hand soldered along with one row of these ICs here. These are two ICs. Strangely, it seems like these were hand soldered. There's a lot of flux. Not exactly sure why, because uh, the rest of the ICs are very clean with no issues. And these connectors as well don't look like they were done by hand, but maybe some rework was done, some repair work at some point on this board, who knows? Here is a cut resistor on the RAM size selection. See that resistor is just floating there. It says 256K bit, one row. I'll have to look at the technical manual to see like what exact configuration this needs to be for the various RAM sizes. But on the Mac Plus, all of the RAM is installed in SIM sockets. And I think it originally came with four 256K SIMs, which would total one megabyte. These two Siemens SIMs are one megabyte each, and these are the original 256K SIMs. So this makes a total of 2.5 megabytes. The axial electrolytics here are what would be the surface mount ones on the newer boards that would leak all over the place. And it's funny, these older technology ones haven't leaked at all. It seems like older was better, at least in this circumstance. There are more capacitors all over the board. These are little bypass gaps, they're glass. And they look kind of like diodes, but see it says C18 and C17. So those are just standard bypass caps as opposed to the normal yellow tantalum looking ones you see on most other boards of this age. On the edge of the board here, it says Mac Plus and the old Apple computer logo, which I just kind of love this retro look to it. 1986 and 1987. But if you recall, I just took this motherboard out of a platinum Mac Plus, which is the later revisions. So that means I should start seeing later date codes on chips. 1988, 17th week right there. 1988, 8th week. 1988, 6th week. There's 1987 up here. Here's 11th week, 1988. And the SCSI controller here is 1988, 11th week as well. So that would imply that this thing was made on the 11th week or after 1988. So really just about two or three years before the Mac Classics were made. It just sort of shows how long Apple was making this Mac Plus pretty much unchanged. So here's my LCR meter. I recently just got this. I haven't really showed it off too much. This allows me to measure the capacitance of capacitors while they're installed in the board. What this does is it lists the capacitance down here in farads, you know, picofarads, microfarads, whatnot. And then up here is D, which I think stands for dissipation. And the lower the D number is, the better. That means the, the capacitor is has less resistance inside. It's kind of similar to ESR, and I'm sure I'm explaining it incorrectly, but let's just test this one axial electrolytic here. It's labeled as 33 microfarad, and we hit that. 
and we're getting 32 microfarad. Now you see D is 0.09, which is relatively low, so I think that capacitor is just fine. And the capacitor right next to it is also 32, and it's measuring just under 32. And the one next to it is also 33, and it's measuring just a couple under, which is just fine. And here's another 33 at 16 volts, and that's fine. And you notice the D factor is fine on all of these. It's basically the same. If we saw a D number that was like over one, then I would be concerned and potentially switch out the capacitor. So these three caps are good, and this one over here is 33. And this one here, I can't read the value on. It's flipped around. But if I test this, put the probes the right way, we're getting 117, 111 microfarad, and the D is 1.2. Here I've switched to the meter into capacitance series and ESR, so we're gonna get a slightly different reading. If we read one of these 33s, and we will see the ESR is around four ohms, which is not great, but you know, it's not super bad. But if we check out this one capacitor here, the one that's a uh, hundred and something microfarads, we're getting 18 ohms, which does seem it could be a little high to me. None of these capacitors are leaking visibly or show any other signs of aging or problems. So I'm not gonna change these out unless this computer is experiencing a fault that's related to these capacitors. Okay, I think it's time to start to look at this analog board. First off, I don't actually know if there's a fault. Perhaps this CRT is just really, really dim and I just need to turn up the G2 or screen or the sub brightness control, which should be one of these controls on the board here. I think the first thing I'm gonna do though is from what I understand, and this is having not done any research, is often solder joints go bad on this particular board. So if we have an issue with the connections to the yoke, for instance, we're not gonna generate any high voltage. And without high voltage, then you're not gonna have an image. So there's a few things I can do to check if what's going on. Maybe I'll check the high voltage with the high voltage probe, but let's just take off this uh, white cover here, and that'll be a first step to check for bad solder joints. That's the very first thing I'm gonna check. Okay, definitely need to clean this. It's kind of gross looking. So everything visually is actually looking really good here. Uh, up here is the connection to the yoke. And I almost think that this, this connection is broken right here. The board's in decent shape. I don't think anyone's ever worked on this, but that looks like it's got a cracked solder joint. This is, these four pins go to the deflection yoke and that may no longer be connected. So I think the first thing I will do is just reflow the solder on this and on all four of these pins actually. So flood some fresh stuff on there. Get that nice and melted. Actually, it looked like the top one was also potentially cracked. All right, for testing, you gotta plug this connector back on the CRT. And you do have to connect the motherboard. You cannot power this up without the motherboard and have it do anything because the motherboard signals are what drive the flyback transformer to actually generate high voltage. So unlike a, an external composite monitor, like say a Commodore 1084, you can turn that on with nothing connected. And of course the monitor has its own oscillator, so it's gonna generate high voltage, it's gonna run. And once you plug the video signal in, it syncs up to that. But this analog board does require the vertical and horizontal sync, especially the horizontal sync, which is what generates the high voltage. So let's connect this back up and I'm gonna leave the motherboard off to the side, kind of like that. And I'm gonna plug in the mains. Now, of course, the cover is not on the side, so you have to be very careful not to touch the board while you're plugging this in. In fact, if you aren't comfortable with high voltage or you don't know what you're doing, don't even work inside these Macintoshes. That's my recommendation. Okay, we're good to go. I'm gonna turn this on, and I should be able to see an image reflecting off my computer monitor, and here we go. I heard a crack like a snap sound. And of course we heard the computer boot. But I, oh, we have image. I can see it reflecting off the screen. So it might have simply been that cracked solder joint. Let me turn this off and flip the computer around. Okay, here we go. Whoa, that motherboard slid there. Look at that. We got a picture and it looks good as well. It's nice and clear. Very, very sharp. Oh yes, thumbs up. That was a very simple fix now, wasn't it? Now I think what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna go over this and look at it very carefully and closely and fix any other solder joints that look suspect. This is the flyback transformer, which has a good amount of weight to it. So some of those can definitely crack. 
Also, these pins here are the connector that goes to the motherboard, so those could be faulty. Just look around and look for any that look suspect and cracked. And you have to look very carefully, look at an angle, use a magnifying glass, and then if you see any that look suspect, reflow them by heating up solder, adding fresh solder to it. Ideally, you should probably clean off the old solder with some braid, put new stuff on, but I can't be bothered. <laughs> I'm actually gonna use my little magnifying loop to help out with this process. Thank you, Phil, for sending that to me. There were a lot of positive comments about how awesome this, this thing is. And I gotta agree, I've used it quite a bit and it's so sharp and so clear when you look through this and it will really help me to be able to see into the solder joints, especially if I look at it at the side like this. So you hold this upside down and then I can look really closely at the joints to see if any looks suspect. Oh, I gotta say that one there looks bad too. I can see a crack in it. So I'm just gonna go through this and reflow any that looks suspect. I wish I had a better way to show these really close up because I looked at this through the loop and absolutely those look cracked as well. Let's see about doing it through the loop like this. I don't know if that's gonna come across. If not, you just have to take my word for it that when you look at it at an angle through this loop, you definitely see the cracks on, this is the connector as well. So the, to be honest, the no video could have been one of this that was an issue and not the ones I reflowed and just me jostling the cables made this work again. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I did find crack solder joints on all of the connectors. So if we turn this, the cable that goes to the neck here, that had crack solder joints. The cable that goes to the yoke had cracks and also the one that goes to the motherboard had cracks. So even though it seemed to work after I reflowed the yoke one initially, could have been one of the other ones too that it was flaky. There was the odd other thing that also looked like it had cracks as well, but none were as bad as the connectors. There was nothing cracked on the flyback except for one pin right here, which is just potentially holding it down. Oh no, there's actually a trace on there. So I mentioned in part one that these Macs can often have reefas connected before the power switch. So power comes in the mains jack here and it goes through these filter caps. Now on this one, it's these film caps, which are fine. These are safe, I don't need to touch these. But on other ones, they've been X, uh, reefa X caps, which of course are connected directly across the mains and can definitely blow up. This Mac does have some Reefa Y caps here, which are also used for filtering. So I think I'm gonna switch those out. I just don't like having Reefa caps in here. They're most likely connected. One of them will be connected between earth and hot or live. And the other one is probably between neutral and earth. I'm not totally positive, but these Y class caps are used for earth connections like that. So I found some class Y1 caps here in a bag that says 400 volts. And I poked one up to the LCR meter and I'm using four wire measurement mode. It's more accurate, especially down low and I can calibrate this thing. And we're getting 455 picofarads for this little tiny capacitor. Inside here, I can see that these are both 220 picofarad Y class caps, these two reefas here that I wanna change. Is that okay to replace the 220s with 440s? And will that still offer decent protection, et cetera, et cetera, or should I just potentially leave these off. I'm not quite sure. So I've made a mistake before. These Y caps that are on here are actually 2200 picofarad. And I look through all the Y1 caps I have, and these are 1000. These are the largest value I have. So I'm gonna replace these 2200s with two of these 1000s. If you're well versed in power supply filtering and putting these lower value in here is a mistake or dangerous, please let me know in the comment section below so I can go correct this. But I'm gonna do this for now because I'm just always concerned that these reefers will leak. And if they do, what happens is when you plug this in is it will trip the RCD or the GFCI breaker. That breaker will detect any leakage from the live or hot line back to ground that causes an imbalance and will trip. 
So when they start to go bad, you will have that tripping. And I've had that before on other power supplies, and that is corrected by swapping out these parts. Okay, there we go. You see there are the two Y caps I just installed. These are the two caps I pulled out. Uh, this one got a little damaged from me prying on it. Got the case cracked a little bit. This one, not so much, but it does have a crack in it as these types of caps seemingly do. Uh, you know, these, oh yeah, these are Rifa brand. I was like, it's not a Rifa. It certainly looks like one, but it says the logo right there. Anyhow, 250 volts, 2200 PFY caps. Okay, I'm pretty confident this thing is gonna work, so it's time for a little cleaning and on the inside. You guys know I like to do this kind of stuff. This drive has this gross corrosion on it. I wonder what that came from. I just don't know. There's another sticker here that fell off. This probably came off the CRT. Uh, 792, blah, blah, blah. Okay, who knows what that means. And this thing is extremely sticky and disgusting. So I'm gonna try to clean this off a little bit. Just pop the cap off. So I found a good way to clean this stuff is with WD-40. So I have a little bit of it on this cloth here and it seems to get the sticky goo off of this uh, really, really well. So there's a little bit of color here. It's a pretty good solvent and same thing for around the CRT here where that thing was, it's all sticky and pretty nasty. So I just use this and it gets the sticky off and makes this, makes this cap look nice again. And then I'll just use some Windex to kind of clean off the uh, WD-40 residue because it does leave that sticky film behind. Same on this uh, cap. But I'm imagining it's probably gonna be fine. I am sure people are gonna go, oh, I'm gonna ruin it by touching it with W40 or whatever. I don't know. I'm not too concerned. The anode cap really isn't that big a deal. This is like a spark plug cable, this high voltage cable here. And then there's a little uh, metal clip here. That's all that's really important going into here. You don't actually need the cap on there. But after some cleaning, this now is not sticky at all. Just feels like soft rubber. It's probably not as soft as the day it was built, but um, it's a lot better than that horrible stickiness that was on there before, right? Let's give this a little quick wipe down. I know this is silly. People are gonna probably say that this is just dumb that I'm doing this, but it makes me happy. So I'm gonna do it. All right, let's reconnect this connector. I'm just gonna put a little deoxid in it because it was pretty tough to get off. Deoxid has a lubricant in it, just makes it easier to connect and reconnect cables. I'll say it went on much easier. Same for this floppy cable. Just drip a little bit in there and then that just pops down just like so. This floppy drive, I can see the eject motor right there. Uh, it's very unlikely that this system is working properly. It's all gummed up, I'm sure. The drive probably works fine, but uh, we'll need a new eject gear. I'm actually out, so I can't service this disk drive at this time, but we can still test it by popping a disk in there and I will just eject it manually using a paper clip. So there's one thing that's left and there is some corrosion here in the battery compartment. So in this little cup here, you can ignore the spray paint on the outside, I have some white vinegar and I'm just gonna put this all over the battery connector here and on the inside to try to neutralize any of the leakage that's happened here. And let's just let that kind of soak a little bit and I'll need to do that on the top. There's a little bit on the top as well. And that's the top connector. The liquid you see there is isopropyl alcohol. That's what I used to clean it up. I put a paper towel underneath this, flooded this with isopropyl, wiped it all up to try to flush away any of the vinegar. And I know I haven't even turned this thing on yet, but I'm going to use a little bit of Windex just to give the front of it a bit of a wipe down because yeah, it's not too dirty. Actually, it looks pretty good, but might as well. I'm confident this computer is actually gonna be working uh, just fine. All right, we need a keyboard. There's a keyboard for it. We need a mouse. I think these might be called tank, tank mice. I mean, I know that's what we call them on the Amiga, but is that what we also call them on the Mac? And I think I actually have a platinum color mouse, but this keyboard is not the platinum color. This is the earlier color, so it's definitely not a good match for this computer. And before I plug this keyboard into the computer, it uses a phone style connection. You have to make sure that you're using the right cable. I have two cables here. This is from a modern desk phone, like a Cisco phone. And this one is one for the Apple computer. It's the right color, but you need to do another final test before you plug the keyboard in because as an FU to customers by Apple, if you use this cable, 
to plug this keyboard in, not only does it not work, it actually destroys the controller inside the keyboard, rendering the keyboard junk. I mean, the switches are still gonna be good, but you will never get the keyboard working again. So you have to use the right cable. So the way you test the cables is you line them up. And if you notice the black cables, they go yellow, green, red, black. And then the next connector, I'm holding them the same way, goes black, red, green, yellow. So they're flipped around. But look at the Apple connectors, black, red, green, yellow, black, red, green, yellow. You have to use this type of connector. And if you use the wrong one, like I said, it will destroy things. So we plug that in there and we plug it into this keyboard like so. And now moment of truth, let's turn this on. Sounded good. Uh, we're getting a black screen. So obviously whatever I fixed, I unfixed. Oh, wait, there we go. Wait, I don't, I don't know what happened there because I swear it wasn't working a second ago and now it is, that's disconcerting. And the screen just went out. I was actually gonna look for a plastic, I was gonna get a plastic poker tool here to start poking around on things and see if I can figure out, aha. So when I bend the analog board, the picture comes on. And that implies that there is still a bad connection. Okay, let's investigate a little further. I just wanna see if the mouse is working. If I hold the cable, it does work. And the keyboard, I guess I can't test because uh, we can't, <laughs> I need to boot the computer up to see if that's working. But if I move the cable that goes to the motherboard, the picture does come on. So I'm wondering if the problem is the connector on the analog board. Yeah, it's gotta be the connector going from the motherboard to the analog board. I'm pushing on the connector itself right now and you see it kind of comes and goes without issue. This might be a job for Deoxit D5. It could be just a bad connection on the connector because I did reflow the pins on the back here. So I'm gonna pull that connector off, spray it with Deoxit and we'll see if that fixes the issue. Here's the connector, this one right here. And when I push on it, it makes the video go in and out. So let's just pull this off and I'm gonna check the connections. I'll check that the uh, the wires themselves are okay. Yeah, I'm gonna look here, make sure everything looks okay. And I'd say it looks totally fine. Everything on the connector on the motherboard also looks pretty good. So I'm not exactly confident that Deoxit's gonna fix this, but first of all, let's put some inside the connector there and I'm gonna spray some on there as well. Now, if this doesn't fix it, it's gonna be a bad solder joint for sure. There's no real other explanation, but at least I've identified where the problem lies. And that's what's good about plastic poker tools. Like you can poke around safely without risking uh, getting a shock. All right, let's turn this on. So I'm getting a weird noise, kind of a high pitched whine. And I don't, that's not good. I have a feeling we're not gonna have a picture, not with that noise. Actually, I do have a picture. So that's weird, what's causing that horrible whine? Yeah, I, I we have a normal, normal picture there, but this does not sound good right now with the whine. Didn't hear that before. Sounds like a coil whine. But that's a bit strange. Let's turn this off and on again. Now what's interesting is the machine's just been running for a little while and that high pitch whine, it just faded away. So we have good sharp image there and let me poke on things, specifically the connector. Yeah, it's it's okay now. So that deoxit, that did the trick. I'm, I'm yanking on it, let's bend the board. When I bent the analog board, it kind of came and went, yep, it's working. So from the very start, the problem might've just been that connector the whole time. Let me turn the computer off and see if that wine comes back. I'll just let it sit a minute. Okay, it's been a few minutes. Let's turn this back on. I've also connected the external disk drive so we can boot this uh, Mac Plus floppy disk here. See if this thing even boots. I have the keyboard and mouse connected as well. Here we go. No wine. That's very strange. I don't really know what that was all about. I am just adjusting the screen control here on the back just so I can get this brightness knob pretty good. Originally with the brightness knob, it had to be all the way near the top to have a good picture. So you turn up the G2 or screen, which is the top potentiometer on the back by the flyback. And then that allows us to brighten it. 
So now with the brightness knob all the way down, now it's now it's much better. So there we go, it's sort of in the middle, the control on the front here. And this other knob is gonna be the focus most likely, which already looks really sharp. I'm, I'm surprised how sharp this is. This looks sharper than all those Mac classics. Okay, anyhow, let's try booting this. I'll use the external drive because we know this works. Awesome. 2560K, just like I thought. 2.5 megabytes of RAM, awesome. I have a cleaning floppy disk, which I'm gonna stick in this internal disk drive here. And I'm doing this booted. That way it won't just try to um, eject the disk right away. I can control the ejection process. And I'm just adding a little isopropyl there. Here we go. You know, that had a nice clunk. So this thing isn't that bad actually. Okay, it's not formatted, which is understandable. I'm gonna use a paper clip to get the disc out. Let's put that back in one more time. All right. Okay, I'm gonna eject this disc. Interesting, pushing the eject button actually doesn't do anything. So I guess that's something that the later Mac controller supported and this one doesn't. And I'll put this disc in here, what's gonna happen? Kind of making some weird noises, but it's definitely working. Let's open up one of these folders. Yeah, it sounds a little weird. Okay, so whatever, it's working. It just needs a good cleaning. Get that out of there. Boot this one more time and I'd say that this machine, other than the disk drive service, which is what it needs, is working great. Oh yes, one more thing to try, let's try the keyboard. This is a test. Sweet, keyboard's working well. This is keycaps. This is keycaps, and you can see the layout of the keyboard. With these Macs, you can only push two keys at a time. It's two key rollover, which is okay. That's good enough for pretty fast typing, but ideally you would like more than two. Otherwise your fast typing could overwhelm and you'll, you will miss key presses. All right, well, nothing blew up with those caps, the Y caps. So we need to put this back on so we don't get shocked. So we'll turn this to the right side. May as well use a little Windex. Just clean off this black dust that's all on this thing. Oh, look at the back. It's all covered in it as well. Okay, I've let this dry. I don't wanna put this back on while it's wet, right? And we gotta put these little thingy majiggies it's like a two-part thing. You just pop it through the hole and push push it in, and then that holds it on. Now we're ready for the back. And the Mac Plus is one of those machines, so it's gonna be impossible to see how all the signatures of the crew that made the Mac, or Mac Plus or whatever, are written in the back of the plastic molding here. So if you have one of these machines, you should check that out. And here we have it. This is one very nice looking Macintosh Plus. Thumbs up. Admittedly, it was an easy fix. I pretty much knew that it was gonna be those bad solder joints or bad connections, but nonetheless, I'm happy this thing works and I'll leave this powered up and booted up off that system disc off to the side just to make sure this thing stays stable. And I have a new label for it. Number two, it works. Refloat solder, floppy needs service, and has 2.5 megs of RAM. This is just to help me remember what's inside of this machine. Right, okay, it's now time for machine number one. This one's pretty darn dirty, both on the front and on the back here. First things first, let's pop the motherboard out of here. If you guys recall and saw the label right on the front just now, this one has a problem where it just continually power cycles. So it may well be that there's a short on the motherboard, could be, or it could be a problem on the power supply board, which is probably more likely the issue. Motherboard is dusty, but otherwise okay. This one also has 2.5 megabytes of RAM, just like the number two machine. They took the resistor off entirely over there. Okay, I'm gonna check these caps on the LCR meter really quick. 31 microfarad for that one. 32 for that, these are 33s. This is the one on the other one that read 100 something microfarad. And I'm getting 30 on this board. So either that one has a higher value installed in it or it's gone bad. And it's possible when they go bad there, they go up in capacitance. If you remember on the other board, this capacitor had a very high D value, but on this one, it's 0.1, it's sort of the same as everything else. 
So that would imply that cap is probably bad. This one strangely is reading this 44 and the D value is 3.6. So it is higher than the rest. And this one's 32 with a D value of 0.1. So it's probably this one is marginal on this board and on that other board, there was a marginal one. One more thing to check on this board before I look at the analog board. So this was the one that was recycling. The power was restarting over and over again. Maybe there's a short on here. So I'm just gonna set this for ohms and I'm gonna check across each of these capacitors and look for a short. This is Lewis Rossman style. That's 1.3K, it's totally fine. Uh, we're getting 10 meg ohm there. That's in the K, so that's fine. We're looking for anything in like the ohms. So that's giving us 111 ohms. That is pretty low actually. And this one is 256 ohms. That's definitely not a short. A short would be close to zero, but that's pretty high. I think I need to get another motherboard. I have another Mac Plus that works, and I'm just gonna check these two caps on that one and see what reading I'm getting there. Here's another Mac Plus board. This one belonged to my father. This is the Mac Plus that he had uh, as his first computer, actually. And uh, he gave me the computer he's held onto his whole time. I haven't really showed it on the channel, but it has a very cool accelerator board that clips onto the processor and gives this thing, I think, a 68020, more RAM, external monitor, stuff like that. I will get to showing that off in the future. These were the caps that had the low resistance. Oh yeah, 146 ohms. It's pretty much identical. This one should be like 250 ohms. Okay, well actually, no, this one is in the kilo ohms, 9.1, but this one, 140K, 140 ohms. Let's just quickly test <laughs> what we're getting here. So this one here is giving us 110 ohms. And this one here, oh, okay, we're in the K, we're AK. I don't know what I don't know what I was reading before. I think I made a mistake there. Okay, so I'm gonna say that there's no shorts on this board. I'm just gonna give it a quick visual inspection. There's definitely some dust and other crap on the board but I don't think there is anything that would cause a short circuit. The back is looking really clean. Very nice. No rework. Remember that other board I said there was rework up at these ports on the top here? Not so on this one. Everything looks good. In fact, same here. It's like as if someone might have reflowed that other one already. Maybe it had some issues. Maybe they tried to fix that video problem already and they tried reflowing this. Although why would they reflow the serial ports? I, I don't know. Although maybe there was problems on these serial ports on the other board. And I see the traces run to these filters. So these were reflowed manually, these were reflowed, and this connector. So I would assume someone had worked over that board to try to fix it. So taking the cover off the side of the analog board is weird on this thing, because instead of having the little plastic clips like on the other Mac Plus, it actually has little foam pads that hold it on, which you have to tear off to remove. It leaves behind these little yellow pads, which are tough to scrape off the board. So that's kind of annoying. So first I'm just gonna do a quick inspection of the electrolytic capacitors on this board to see if any are leaking. Right off the bat, everything looks okay. I don't see any visible problems. But looking down here by the power switch, you do see that this machine has reefa caps. So just leaving this thing plugged in could result in a smoke screen. It is odd because one of the two filter caps is actually a film cap, which I wonder if it's been replaced before because these types don't explode. So before I do anything, it's time to pull out the Y caps and the Rifa X cap and replace them with something more reliable. With the board out, I'm just giving it a closer inspection, looking for any capacitors that may have leaked or any visible problems like blown out components or things that look damaged. And on the back, I'm also giving it a very close inspection, making sure I don't see any issues like broken solder joints or anything burned. 
I'm using the iPad to look at schematics for this board, just so I can try to get a feel for the way it's designed and laid out. When troubleshooting a switch mode power supply like this, it's imperative you look for shorts using the diode check of your multimeter and also check the resistance values against what's on the schematics because those can drift over time, which can throw the whole thing off balance. So I didn't find any shorts on diodes. I didn't find any shorts on the rails. There's uh, all four rails, well, two 12 volts, minus 12 and a plus five. All of those are fine, no shorts. I checked the switching transistors for shorts and I didn't find any there as well. So I think the next thing I'm gonna try is to power this up and I'm going to check the output to see what voltages we're getting, even in the brief time that this thing runs for before it switches off. And looking at the schematics, there's R56 potentiometer, which seems to adjust the voltage on the entire board. Maybe it's so out of whack, like I need to hit that with deoxit and that'll get this thing regulating properly. And that is the ground. I'm gonna to try to power this up and just take a look at how things look. Now, if you're gonna work on a power supply, you need to know what you're doing. There's dangerous mains voltage on this board. Uh, high voltage will not be generated because without the motherboard connected, there's no flyback drive, which comes from the horizontal sink. So I don't have to worry about that, but there are still plenty of dangerous voltages on this side of the board. So you must know what you're doing. So I have these multimeter connected to five volts. And if I turn this on, okay, so it's, clicking, clicking away, but it does generally, def it's almost hitting five volts looking at the little bar graph here. Let me adjust this pot here. This is, I think should change the voltage regulation. So I can hear a difference in the clicking it's making, but it's definitely still restarting. So I'm gonna turn this off and I'm going to unplug the mains connector. So my hunch is the problem lies on the primary side. Well, I'm gonna use my LCR meter to start checking the resistors and checking the capacitors everything around here and just see if everything is within spec. All right, I've been looking at the capacitors with the LCR and some of them are not registering and it just shows OL. So I'm gonna mark the ones that are actually measuring like that and I'm gonna pull them off the board and I'll test them off the board. So these are the two caps that I just removed from the board that weren't reading with the LCR meter when they were in circuit. And now when I measure them, they measure totally perfect. Good ESR good capacitance, so they seem fine to me. Well, well, well. Okay, I've learned a couple things fiddling around. First off, the main input caps, these two purpley violet color ones, they retain a charge when you have the power unplugged. And let's just say I got a shock from it. <laughs> it's not that bad. I mean, it was just like eight stings for a split second. It's not gonna kill you, especially if it's unplugged from the mains and you're just getting a stored charge, but it gives you a little zap. But something else, when you turn this on with no load, you get that clicking sound. So I just, I can't find anything wrong on this thing. So what I did is I plugged the motherboard in and it seemed to start up. Like I heard the beep. So it's working, I guess. And I checked the voltage five volt rail and I adjusted this pot and you know I got it just right, 5.00. So I think I'm gonna put this back in the chassis so we can plug the monitor in and see if it generates high voltage. Maybe it'll start tripping again if I connect the high voltage and I connect the deflection yoke. But right now, without the deflection yoke, it's not generating high voltage, but the computer does seem to boot. So it's a real mystery. I didn't change a thing. Only thing I have is still have the reefer caps removed. I haven't reinstalled those. Even though I took out these caps to test on the LCR and they were fine, I just put them back in. It's very confusing to me what's going on. Okay, this is hooked up enough to turn on. High voltage is connected to the CRT. Let's turn it on. Are we gonna get clicking? No clicking. <laughs> I just, I don't understand. Why is it working? Turn the volume or brightness up. I see an image. It's very, very dim though. I'm gonna use the iPad in front of the monitor so I can see the picture. And I'm getting the flashing question mark. So what, what the heck is happening? I do not understand. Why is this working? It doesn't make sense. All right, well, I guess there's a couple things. I guess it's good that the motherboard works. I didn't have to troubleshoot any faults with this. And the analog board works. Will it stop working? I am, I don't really understand. I don't know. 
Well, these are the worst kinds of problems because I haven't figured out what actually is wrong with this board and probably whatever the fault was will come back. So I think all I can do is reassemble this machine, clean it up, and expect that this analog board will stop working again. One of the faults that is common apparently on these is the flyback can short out internally. And if that happens, you have to replace the flyback and it will cause that clicking. Well, because I have an image, I don't think the flyback is the problem. So whatever the fault is, is something else. And it's, I guess, intermittent. But definitely one of my problems with my methodology is I did all my testing with the motherboard disconnected because I assumed like with the Mac Classic, you could actually run it without the motherboard and it wouldn't trip. It wouldn't go to over voltage or have an issue with a no load. But with the Mac Plus, if you don't have a load, you get that clicking. So I guess that means all my further testing, if this thing has a fault again, means I need to keep the motherboard connected or at least put a load on the five or the 12 volts. Anyhow, let me put this thing back together. All right, it has been a few days since I put the Mac Plus back together. This one does have this anti-theft thing on the back and I had tried to take it off, but it's pretty much impossible. At least I have no idea how to get this off. I tried heat. It's almost like some type of glue was used that bonded with the plastic, like melted the plastic. It's not a big deal. It's on the back, so I don't care. So let's see if this thing still works after sitting a few days. That sounds normal to me. There we go, flashing question mark. So no strange noises and it seems to work fine. So let's do the ultimate test, connect some peripherals and make sure it works really. I plugged in the external floppy drive I've been showing off on the other computers because this internal drive, I haven't serviced it yet. I have the extended keyboard plugged in, the mouse and a SCSI zip drive since the Macintosh Plus has no internal hard drive. First, let's boot this Mac Plus system tools disc that I have. Right off the bat, it's booting normally, seemingly. Uh, 2.5 megs of RAM, which is exactly what it should be. Well, let's restart this. Let's boot this zip disk here. It's got System 6 on it, which is perfect for this age of a machine. And just like that, it's booting. I gotta say, these SCSI zip drives are pretty fantastic for these older Macintoshes. A quick way to get 100 megs of storage on them, and not to mention you can have multiple disks, like one that has System 7 on it, one with System 6 and other versions of the OS, so you can just quickly boot up the one you're particularly looking for. We have System 607, and I even have a few games on here, so let's run Crystal Quest, which will test the sound and mouse and whatever. It's an awkward angle. I am standing while playing this. It's not ideal. I actually rather love this game. I played a lot of it in my youth. And uh, whenever I sit down at a Mac with this game, I kind of can't stop but play like crazy. And it was just last night on the other Mac Plus that I got my highest score ever. Level 45, 3.67 million points. Definitely the highest I've ever gotten. Although it's a little bit of a cheat when you use the Mac Plus because these computers are slower than all the other Macs. So the game has a lot of slowdown at those really high levels where there's a lot going on which actually makes the game a little easier. So I have to apologize that it wasn't more of an interesting fix for this machine. It just sort of works and I really didn't do anything to it. I couldn't find a fault and now it just magically works. It's possible some of the capacitors maybe are marginal and just using the machine has sort of had them reform a little bit, making them work enough that this works. But you guys saw it, it definitely was not working when I first tested it with everything connected. So your guess is as good as mine. I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you think is wrong. Anyhow, I have a label to put on the front here. This is machine number one. It now works, maybe has marginal caps and still needs the floppy service. Well, I think that's it. I think I'm gonna call it on this classic Macintosh Repair-a-thon series. A lot of people asked if I was gonna repair the motherboard from that one classic that had the battery leakage. And I think I'm not gonna do that. You saw me throw away the chassis that was all rusty. And really, this is gonna be kept for a parts board in case one of these other classics ever needs a donor chip. There is still disk drive service to do on all of these, but I'm out of those little 3D printed gears. I'm gonna try to make some of my own using a new 3D printer I got, SLA. But until I get that thing set up, these drives and these machines are not gonna be fixed at this point. If I need to boot something on one of these, I can just use that external floppy drive. It's easy enough. 
So thanks very much for sticking through this entire series and watching and commenting and liking my videos. I really appreciate it, it means a lot. And of course, I'd love to hear your comments and your suggestions on this series and everything else in the comment section below. Subscribe for more videos, there'll be lots more in the future. And that's gonna be it. Thanks very much for watching, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.